Welcome. Welcome to the ISC 12 Think Tank Series. This is hosted by HPC Wire, and today's topic will be the top 500 20 years later. My name is Jeff Hyman. I'm the president and group publisher of Tabor Communications, which publishes HPC Wire, HPC in the Cloud, Datanami, and Digital Manufacturing Report. I'm joined today by three of the industry's top analysts. I, I see many of the people in the room. I don't think any of them need introduction, but for those of you who do not know, to, directly to my right is Christopher Willard, co-founder, chief resource, uh, resource officer for Intersect 360 Research. To, in the center seat is Peter Fuchs, research director for servers and virtualization for the InfoPro, which is a division of 451. And on the far right, we have Earl Joseph, Program Vice President of High Performance Systems at IDC. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Oh, thank you. Hi there, Jeff. The last 20 years, top 500, it's been an extremely useful benchmark, something that I think everybody in the room and in the audience is familiar with. Uh, it's been on the go for 20 years. I'd sort of like to take a, a past, present, and future perspective on where it is, where it was, where it's going. We have a series of questions. I'd love to get all of your opinions and work progressively. Question number one, what do you think are the most important aspects of the top 500 that have led it to be such a widely accepted and widely used benchmark? I yes. think the most important aspect of it is its ability to gain the attention of the world and focus it on supercomputing uh, twice a year. And that's really very important just to be able to say, here is a technology, and it's a very important technology, and look at how fast it's progressing. Yeah. Um, well, building on what Chris said, it gives a fair benchmark that actually scales over time. If a week is a long time in politics, 20 years is a huge time in science. And top 500 scales with it. And it's also accessible to the people who don't understand, outside this community, how computing works. So using that number, although it doesn't mean what the science is, you can see which vendors are contributing, you can see which uh, governments and areas are contributing. So you, you can map, for example, growth in economic areas when you start seeing Russia, China, Africa beginning to come up with supercomputing centers. You can see the social impact of this, and I think it makes it accessible. And it also, of course, provides political incentive for people to invest and further science and feel that it's important. Right, so a couple attributes I think are real crucial. One, since it's a singular number, it allows you to actually compare the machines. Now, a lot of people criticize it because LinPack doesn't represent all applications, but it's dramatically better than just a calculated peak performance because it shows the machine works and you have to go through a certain amount. But by doing it, the other part that I like the best, it's really a proxy for innovation and innovation to potential capability of countries. And so the trend lines do show how countries are changing their viewpoint of doing research and development by using HPC as a tool. Okay. We've seen the latest top 500 list and that represents a significant achievement for all of those in the new submissions. If you took into consideration the HPC facility, facilities work that support the high performance community, how well do you think the top 500 benchmark ranking corresponds to the way these systems are used in real world applications? Uh, I think there's a, a benchmarking paradox. If a benchmark can be understood, it is not particularly representative, and if it is representative, it cannot be understood. Uh, and this, you know, this dates back to the Livermore loops, uh, which worked their way down to a, to a single number, and it, it turned out that even Livermore didn't use those loops that much. And on the other hand, we have the challenge benchmarks, uh, which try very hard to be representative, uh, but the, the flood of data and the different sorts of measures, we don't really hear from them that much, and it's uh, much more expensive to actually run those benchmarks. Okay. So I've talked all around the questions. I say that I. I guess a, a conclusion would be that, uh, you know, of, of the realities of the world, this is probably as good as we can hope to get. Peter? Um, well, I think we've all said that, you know, eight, HPL is extremely important, but it doesn't measure everything. But this is a non-trivial benchmark to run. You know, it takes a lot of investment. It does show the potential of a large system and the ability of an organization to deliver that capability. And 
along with the benchmark, there's an awful lot of background information. You've got the characteristics of the machine. You've got the institution itself. So people who are interested in what's going on can take that information as a starting point, use their own knowledge. If they're into climate research or into something else, they can look at what's going on and move beyond the top 500. So it's a great starting point. Yes, it doesn't measure everything, but I think it's a huge starting point. I would add to that that I think there's a continuum of benchmarks. And so, as I mentioned earlier, a calculated peak performance is the only thing you can look at before a machine is constructed. Then you have the LINPAC that kind of you can run as soon as that machine is working. But all users are really going to run their own individual benchmarks. As Chris was saying, the complexity out there is just so high. To really understand how the system is going to work for your needs, you need to run your own uh, mix of benchmark tools on it. But that said, as far as the tool being useful, if there's small differences between uh, the machines on the LINPAC, I think it's almost useless. But when you start looking at what's happened in the last two years, where machines are becoming four times faster than the last one on the list, this case here is 60% faster. When you're talking about changes and differences like that, it doesn't really matter how specific the tool is. These are dramatically different sizes and growth rates, rates in systems. All right. Thank you. A little technical difficulty. <laughs> um, so that begs the follow-up. If you could change one or two things, top 500, what would you do? Sure. So I've got two of the th top things on my list. Um, the first thing I'd like to see is to see the actual selling price of the machine added to the list so that one can calculate a price performance. Now, again, again, the performance metric is better than peak. It's not a perfect one. But for if you look at the list right now, more than a third of them are publicly announced, and the dollar amounts are there. And one could also require, over time, the vendors to actually put the price of the system or the users and then do some estimates. But I think by knowing the price performance of the systems, you could do a much better job of comparing them and understanding which way the technologies are going. The second major change I think would be interesting, very interesting, and Jack Dungare I know is working very hard to get the LIMPAC so it doesn't take so many hours to run and so many days to run. And he's looking at different alternatives to you know, make it more compact. And I'd like to, it'd be tremendous to me to see if that could be designed so it could be run on the cloud environments. So for example, if I'm an end user interested in how large of capacity various clouds are, whether it's the Amazon cloud, Microsoft, and all the various ones, it'd be tremendous if you could actually have Linpack runs to see what these clouds really look like. Okay, Peter, your thoughts? Um, a little bit different to Earl. I'm not sure you can do the pricing thing in a reasonable way. But um, I think we need to get more relevance to different workloads somehow. When top 500 started out, floating point was hard. Now, floating point is practically free, but you've got memory, which is a huge issue, moving large amounts of data around. And I think moving forwards, if we're looking at the next 20 years, then we've got to start looking at things that measure other aspects and have some diversity to other workloads. So certainly not replacing LINPAC, but seeing if we can find some other ways that we can stress other things that match better to certain other types of workloads. And then maybe the second thing would be behind those things that we could measure, um, getting some characterization of workloads so that you say, well, how much does HPL actually benefit this kind of workload and how much does something else benefit this kind? So people from outside can just get a bit more broader view. Chris, what do you think? Uh, I might add a note saying don't try this at home. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the greatest strength of the, of the LINPAC benchmark is it gets everyone's attention. And, and in the Zen sort of way, it's also the greatest weakness is it f gets a laser focus on one number, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, you know, sometimes can lead to trouble in, in justifying purchases. I would, I think that the industry as a whole really needs to say this is a, this is a great uh, event, a great uh, competition, but uh, like, uh, like the Olympics, you can't find one number that adequately compares all of the different athletes and all the different events. And really just uh, extend the message once we get their attention to say there's lots of different things you do. Uh, with supercomputers and high-performance computing other than a Saxby operation. Okay. Talk a little bit about the difference between, let's say, the top 500 and the graph 500 and, and why we should be looking maybe more at one or the other given all of the new changes in the, the world and the, you know, the, the coming attraction of big data and things of that. Earl, right. So I think the graph 500 is tremendous. I'd like to see actually a few more additional benchmarks actually hit the world too for testing out the different attributes of the system. I agree completely with what Peter and Chris were saying. 
each of the user environments and what's going on are very different. Now, you bring up big data or data intensive computing. I think that is an entirely different type of computing as far as what we're evolving into. We've seen over the last five years this explosion in storage and data, but also we've seen an explosion in sensory data coming into a system and video data. So being able to deal with these mixed data sets, I think is an entirely different system design that could be productive at that. Okay. Peter, what do you think? Um, yeah, I would agree. I think it's hard because often as, as you move forwards, if you're going to measure big data, you've got to get data sets and so many data sets are proprietary, people won't necessarily release them or have something that really is measurable. But I think the SPEC initiative did a good job, much smaller systems, where they would release a number, one for integer, one for floating point, but underneath it there was a set of different benchmarks that related to different workload characteristics. And so you could dig in underneath if you were interested, and if you were in a certain business, you could look at the subsets that matched the workloads that you wanted to do. And if, if you could do that with the top 500 in some way, um, then you'd still get the one number which is useful, but you could have a little bit of that color underneath it. Okay. Chris, what do you think? Uh, you know, um, sort of let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, the more information we get out about the industry, the better. I think with, with Graph, one of the things we've seen is that for a lot of the non-technical people, the term doesn't, uh, doesn't resonate well. And that, uh, that one of the things we need to do is, is try to figure out how the uh, new uh, business HPC application users could resonate to, to the graph type of applications that went along with it. Okay. Well, we only have a couple more minutes left. Um, I think I'd like to finish with, with asking, you know, what's going to happen in the next 20 years? You know, we saw what happened this year. The, the IBM machine that was just voted number one, came in in the top 500 this year, was 60% faster than last year's. I mean, it's amazing, right? So what happens in the next 20 years? Where, with this road Texas scale, where, where are we in the next 20 years, and how is the top 500 going to play a role in it? Earl, what do you think? So I, I think the kind of contest for having the largest supercomputer has, again, dramatically changed in the last 10 years. Uh, in most countries wanted to have the number one on the list. And I think uh, the US always recognized, so did Europe, that it really wasn't about having the number one system on the list. It's about having enough systems to help your engineers and scientists really make uh, progress. So I think the new contest is who has the most giant machines, so to speak. And I believe the Chinese really understand this well. They have anywhere between 15 to 20 petascale you know, centers under construction right now. We think the kind of battle to have the largest system and the largest number of large systems is going to escalate dramatically. And right now, we feel our forecasts are actually understating what's going to happen. So who will have the first exascale is quite interesting. The fascinating thing to us is we think there will be up to one or two billion dollar supercomputers in the next five years. And so we're trying to find out, will that actually happen? And so to put it in perspective of size and potential leapfrogging could be dramatic. Sure. Peter, what do you think? Certainly I agree that breadth is very important and once again the more you think about different types of workloads you get you know more purpose oriented systems mm -hmm. but to get to exascale and beyond the technologies have got to change hugely one of the great things about the top 500 is you know you can look at it now you get measures of cores for complexity you get the performance you get the energy footprint of the system and as we move forwards, I think if we can expand that out a little bit, so if we get something like Memristor technology or something else that dramatically changes things, we can still have that built into the top 500 program. And it's that expansion which will keep the program as the right thing to be. It's just that the nature over 20 years has to evolve a little bit. Okay. Chris, final thoughts? Well, I'm going to echo what uh, my colleagues have said in that I think 20 years uh, from now, supercomputers are going to look very, very different from what they are today. And I, I fully expect there to be a top 500 benchmark there, but that may also look very, very different from what we have today. Yeah. Uh, but the, you know, we are hitting, hitting some limits of physics, and uh, the path ahead is not as clear as it has been in the past. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of very smart people in the world working to figure out what to do next. So it's going to be interesting times. Right. Well, that's a good way to end because those really smart people that Chris are talking about really are the audience that, that tune into something like this. You know, this is a vibrant community and it's going strong. 20 years is going to pass by like that. Um, the only thing I can be certain of is you guys will keep creating new technologies. These guys will keep reporting and analyzing. We're going to keep covering it and we thank you for your time and attention. 
I'd like to thank the panel. It's not easy to get three people that are this busy, a conference like this, all on the same stage for a few minutes. Uh, we'd like to thank the audience for listening in. We'd like to thank the staff from ISC for inviting us, and we'd like to bid you a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.